God, we give you thanks. You're worthy of our praise this morning, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.
Yes, Father. Lord, we declare this morning, we declare from our living rooms this morning that you are still God, you're still on the throne, and when you start a work, you finish it. You turn graves into gardens. You take, you take where there is no way and you make a way. Oh God, we remind ourselves right now that nothing is impossible for you. That you're the God, you're the way-making God. You always make a way, we're never trapped. We're never trapped with you, God. So we remind ourselves this morning, in our living rooms, in our current situation, we fix our eyes and our hearts, we put them back on you, God. You're the way-making God. And so, Father, I thank you that this morning you're reminding us that you're taking the grave and you're turning it into a garden. We remind ourselves of that. We encourage ourselves of that this morning. We thank you, Father. We love you, Lord. We remind ourselves that nothing is too big for you. Nothing is impossible with you. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. We remind ourselves that you're for us not against us, that you love us. We love you, Lord. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for joining us this morning for our, for our uh, Lighthouse Online family. Hey, we miss you. We love you. We're praying for you. And if this is your first time joining us this morning, thank you for joining us. We welcome you. We love you. And we hope to meet you soon after all this stuff is over. Hey, in a few seconds, we're going to have an opportunity to give our tithes and our offerings. And what's going to happen is there's going to be some instructions that are going to come on the screen. And for those of you who give your tithes and your offerings, you can follow those instructions and they will help you be able to give this morning. During that time, we want to encourage you to say hello in the chat. Uh, let us know how you're doing. Send a virtual high five or a virtual peace sign or, you know, whatever the kids are doing these days. Then after that, Dr. Ken's going to come up and give an awesome word that you'll be blessed with this morning. So, hey, let me pray for you one more time, and then um, we're going to give, and Dr. Ken's going to come up and minister. So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for all that you're doing. Despite the fact that we can't meet here in one corporate setting, we thank you that we are still meeting. We thank you that even though we're in our living rooms, you are still here with us. And so, God, we thank you. We love you. We thank you that as we give this morning, we're blessed. We thank you that as we receive your word, we're blessed. You are the God that turns graves into gardens. We love you, Jesus. We thank you. We bless you. In Jesus' name.
Well, good morning. Can you believe that it is May 3rd, 2020? I say that because two years from now, if we're listening, if we're looking back in time, uh, that uh, it, it, we might actually, it might actually make sense, some of the stuff that's going on. But anyway, we are, I don't know, 40, 40 however many days into this whole uh, social isolation thing that's going on. And, uh, but you know what? Here's the, the good news. The Word of God is not bound. The Word of God is not bound by any circumstance in our world. The Word of God is not bound by the laws of men. The Word of God is not bound. It still grows faith in people's hearts, and so I'm excited to share the word with you today. Um, I want to talk to you on the subject of it's time to grow. It's time to grow up, and uh, so I, I want to I want to just really. Uh, massage some things into your thinking. This kind of builds on where we were uh, talking from last week uh, as far as the kingdom of God and what we're hearing, what we're listening to, and what we're holding on to. So I want to share a passage with you from Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. The word says, we have much to say about this, but it is hard to explain because you are slow to learn. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary truths about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instruction about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment, and God permitting, we will do so. Let me pray for you this morning. Father, I just pray that as we get into this word together today, I pray, Lord, that it would find a a place in our hearts, that we can take a hold of it, that we would recognize, Lord, there is a timeline for us to grow by, that there is a, a, a pathway for us to grow on, that your word entering into our hearts causes us to grow in faith and understanding and positions us to be a, a greater source of influence in the lives of the people around us. Lord, we don't want to stay infants. We want to grow on to maturity. Thank you, Lord, for this word today in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, so I want to start off by telling you a little bit of a story. When I was in high school, uh, you heard me uh, tell the story before. I lived in western North Carolina. In this particular season, we were living in a single wide trailer up a really narrow, uh, steep driveway. And uh, I would go up there every day and and back and forth, go into school, ride the bus from the bottom of the hill, that kind of thing. And we had neighbors on the, the right and the left and across the street from us. And uh, one day, uh, we heard, a, a, we heard a, a, a siren, and I looked out the front, and because we were higher up, I could see that this house down below us was on fire. And everybody got out, everything was fine, but that house burned to the ground. And uh, long, the long and the short of it was, probably about two months later, a neighbor who was across the street um, had... Uh, had a, another house that had, they had two houses. They had built a house uh, for a, a mother who had passed away, and then they had their own house, and they had downsides moved into the smaller house, and they decided that they would sell that larger house to the people who had burned out, but it was across the road. There were power lines. There were a lot of things that they had to do, but they decided, hey, let's go find a house mover, and let's move that house across the road and set it up uh, on the same lot as the house that had burned. What a great idea, right? All you need is a house mover. Who'd ever thought? I never knew anything like that existed. I didn't know that you had people that could lift up a whole house, a two-story house, but mind you, and move it across the street or down the street or wherever you wanted it to go. How crazy was that? And I was a high schooler, and I didn't have a whole lot to do, and so I spent a lot of time going down, and I watched as they took the excavator, and they busted down the old uh, house that had burnt down, and then uh, I watched as they painstakingly took the measurements on the foundation of the house that was going to be moved, and they came over and they dug footers exactly in line with the, uh, the foundation that was going to have to be set, and then the block masons came in, and they, after they poured the footer, then they came in and they laid those block out, and they painstakingly went back and measured all the foundations again for that house. Both foundations matched, and then what was interesting, I was there the day. 
that the house mover showed up with all of his huge equipment, his trailers, his hydraulic jacks, everything. And he began to talk uh, to uh, a few people that were standing by. And I'd never seen anything like this happen. They, it was a big operation. They had to come and, and the, the power company had to come and move the power lines and all that kind of thing for, for it to take place. But this house mover, he was fascinating. He seemed kind of like full of himself. But what I really realized was he really just knew his trade. And so he told one of the uh, guys standing by, I believe it was a homeowner, I can't remember, but uh, he said, you know what, I'm going to put a glass of water completely full on your dining room table. And he said, I'm going to move this house across the road and I'm going to set it on that foundation and I'll bet you $50, I'll bet you $50 that there won't be a drop of water on the, uh, on the table next to that glass, that all the water will still be in the glass. And the homeowner was, at this point, he was tickled that he was getting a new house. Okay, I'll take that bet. And uh, sure enough, this guy said, you know, in, in passing, he said, that house won't even know that it's been moved. And it took a few hours, but when a few hours w- was over, they brought that house over, set it down on the foundation. Everybody stood around. Uh, the homeowner and the house mover went inside the house. Sure enough, not a drop of water outside of that glass. Now, I learned a few things about that uh, just in passing because I always, I've always been interested in logistics and rigging and big trucks and moving stuff. It just fascinates me. But what was amazing to me about this whole thing uh, was that the, the, the importance of having that foundation foundation just right, and the fact that you had a, a, a mover, uh, or in, in a, another case, a builder, someone that knows construction so, so well that they can move from one foundation to the next and build that thing up. The foundation is so important, and we don't often think about it, but the foundation is what the rest of the house sets on, but the foundation isn't the whole house. You got to have the house. The foundation without the house is no place to live. And so, what I want to talk to you today is about this interplay between the foundation of your life and your life. And I think I can get at what the writer of Hebrews is talking about. You see, I believe the church today is full of infants. We're full of people uh, in in the the church, in the body of Christ at large, that haggle over elementary truths, that argue and quarrel and fuss and fight over uh, this list that the writer of Hebrews says, these are all just elementary truths. These are things that ought to be foundational. These are things that are just given, but they're not the whole house. But in the body of Christ, we spend so much time haggling over them, we never really go on to maturity. We never really move into the place that we should be where we're training and teaching and growing other people. And so let me talk to you about this list. Um, So the writer of Hebrews says, milk is for infants. The infants have elementary teachings about Christ. and, And here's the list that he provides. Repentance from acts that lead to death. Faith in God, instruction about baptisms, notice that's plural, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Now, what he's telling us is that these elementary truths are things that we need to take on as our foundation. Now, in in chapter 6, just a, a few verses in, he says, let us leave these and go on. But What I want to suggest to you is that he's not saying leave them behind and forget about them. He's not saying that those things don't matter. He's saying there's more in store. There's more to grow your life. These are just foundational matters. Lock those things into your foundation. The foundation doesn't move. The foundation stays there. It's laid. It's established. But now grow on to maturity. Grow up and be that person God wants you to be. And and so uh, let's talk about some of these things. Notice that he says repentance from acts that lead to death. Now, what do we need to repent from? We need to repent from the things that are in the world that have found their way into our life. Uh, the, The word of God tells us to be in the world but not of the world. The word of God tells us that anything that the Bible says is sin is sin. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty clear, isn't it? If I can find a chapter and verse and I can point to it and I can say, this is what this is and the Bible says it's sin, then that's something that you as a believer need to change your mind about and you need to say, okay, if this is in my life, it needs to get out of my life. But what we've done in the church is we've decided to take 
those sections of the Bible out and not believe them. We've decided that we'd rather change the forever settled word of God than change our itty bitty life. That we'd, we'd rather change what God has to say rather than what, how we live. And so the Bible tells us that in order for us to understand an elementary truth, we've got to get down this issue of repentance. Repentance is a pathway. It's a lifestyle. You and I will never be done repenting until we see Jesus. We're going to have something to repent of. There's all always going to be something in our life that, that needs to change, something in our mind that needs to, uh, we need to rethink. Uh, you know, if it weren't that way, we would already be God, but we're not. Touch your neighbor and say, guess what? There is a God and you're not him. So uh, you and I need to realize that repentance from acts that lead to death, those things are foundational truths. They're elementary. We can't argue over those. We can't, you know, if somebody says, you need to repent, you, need, you say, you, you know what, you're right. You might see one thing, but I see 50 things, and you're right, I need to repent. There's no issue about that. That's a pathway for your life and for mine. Secondly, faith in God. Faith in God. You know, I, I have so many people that are concerned about so many things right now. When I talk with them, they're anxious. They're worried. How are we going to handle this? How are we going to handle that? And it seems so pat, and I don't mean it this way, but there is a God, and we can trust him. You see, before you and I were ever born, he created this world for us to live in. Before you and I were ever born, he created oxygen that we could breathe. He, he built an atmosphere so that we could walk around in it. He, he provided a way by which we could eat food. He, he made all of these things possible, even without our help. He made all of these things happen. There is a God, and he is. If, you, if you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, then he is your heavenly Father, and he knows your need. Put your faith in him. Put your trust in him. You're, you're trusting in something today, and if you still have worry in your heart, if you still have anxiety in your heart, then I would say that, there, that there's still room for you to put more faith in God. If you're still struggling over, you know, over what's going to happen in the future, you haven't committed your future to God. And I want to just challenge you today, leave behind this, uh, this elementary truth. I will trust God. Nail it down. I don't know what's going to happen, I, but I'm going to leave my future in his hands. He already has my eternity, so I might as well give him my next 70 or 80 years, right? I can trust him. I can have faith in God. It's Instruction about baptisms. Here's an elementary truth for you and I that we need to nail down. You know the Bible tells us there's not just one baptism, there's three. Did you, do you realize that? That there are three baptisms and yet many parts of the body of Christ, don't, they only recognize one, some recognize two. Uh, some of them recognize all three. We, we don't really, we, we quibble over those things. We say, oh no, you, you know, we, you got all there was of the Holy Spirit when you, got, uh, when you got born again. And so you were baptized into the body of Christ and baptized in the Holy Spirit at the same time. Well, I believe the Bible doesn't teach that, uh, that there is a, a baptism in the Holy Spirit as well as a baptism into Christ as well as baptism in water, but instructions in baptisms, these are elementary truths. Here's the point. If God tells you to get baptized in water, get baptized in water. Why are you waiting? Don't wait. If, the, if uh, when you receive Christ, you were baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit, praise God for that. You are in Christ. You are fully immersed in him. The word of God tells us that you should be baptized in the Holy Spirit, that, that the Holy Spirit uh, wants, that Jesus wants to immerse you in the power of the Holy Spirit. And when you're immersed in the Holy Spirit, his power comes in your life. And it's, there's, a, uh, there's a release of his power in your life that is life-changing. These are uh, elementary truths, foundational for you and I to live in. Let me move on. I'm not going to hit on all these, but I just wanted to hit on a few. Laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. Laying on of hands, I believe this laying on of hands has to do with... Uh, uh, not just uh, laying out of hands for uh, when people are sick, that, that believers can lay hands on them to pray for them that they might be healed. But I also believe it has to do with the laying on of hands uh, for, uh, for releasing ministry into the lives of other people, for the transfer of the gifts of the Spirit, for the stirring up of leadership in others. Uh, the Scripture says that Joshua had uh, great wisdom because Moses laid his hands on him. Uh, they're, they're, the laying out of hands has to do with a transfer of leadership. And these, these are things that are elementary truths that, are, that should be established in your life and mine. So what do we do? 
What are we supposed to do? If we don't leave those things behind, what are we supposed to do with them? How do we grow on to maturity? How do we grow up? Well, we grow up by constantly using them. My faith in God is constantly used. My baptism in the Holy Spirit, constantly used. I, I, I reach back and I remember the, trend, the, the change in my life when I was uh, baptized into Christ and water baptized. Those things are, are truths that are in my life that have been here all along. That if I hadn't been water baptized, if I, I remember the cleansing that took place in my life when I got water baptized. I remember that. And there are times when I feel challenged uh, because of the world that I live in, the pressure that you and I face on a daily basis uh, to, to compromise in our walk with God. But it's so good to know that I know that I've been baptized into Christ. I know that I know that I know that I'm a believer in Christ, that I am forgiven, and that my faith in God will hold strong. And so these are constant uses for these elementary truths. You know, if the, body, if the body of Christ has so many infants, what, what they have to do is they, instead of quarreling over the elementary truths, what they need to do, what we need to do is use those truths on a regular basis in our life. Um, so what is repentance at, at, from acts that lead to death? Let me remind you. These are just reminders, and I'm not going to go back over everything I talked about a minute ago. But Galatians 5.18 says, but if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. This is Paul to the Galatians, and he says, these are things you just need to know that you've got to repent of because they're acts of the sinful nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, uh, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God, and that in this matter no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. The Lord will punish men for all such sins as we have already told you and warned you. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, he who rejects this instruction does not reject man, but God who gives you his Holy Spirit. In other words, Paul is saying, don't shoot the messenger. It wouldn't help because you're not rejecting me in the first place. You're rejecting the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that wrote these words. The Holy Spirit is the, is the, message, the, the one who brought the message to us. And so when we, we reject his claims on our life and our lifestyle, we're rejecting God. It's not the messenger. We're rejecting God himself. Solid food is for the mature. Now, this idea of teaching about righteousness, let's, let's shift over for the next few minutes and just talk about this teaching about righteousness. Teaching about righteousness has to do with the grace of God, the grace of God. It's the grace of God that you and I can walk in righteousness, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, he became poor. So that uh, for our sakes, we might become rich. He wanted to do a work of righteousness in you and I. That, that he would release his righteousness to us. That all came by grace. It all came not from works, not because we got it figured out, not because we have it all together. It's all according to God's grace. Now let me talk to you for a minute about this grace. Titus chapter 2 verse 11 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These, then, are the things you should teach, encourage, and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. Can I just encourage you with this word today? That every decision to say yes to God is a vote uh, for, for righteousness in your life. That every time you are tempted or tested, 
every time that you walk through a, a situation and you might be in a valley and you say, well, I, I know if I go this way, I'm in the flesh. If I go this way in the spirit, that if you will choose the grace of God, you have the opportunity to do that. If you will choose the grace of God, you're voting for God's righteousness to happen in your life. You have a choice in the matter. You have a choice to choose life. And every time you do that, you're walking in more righteousness than you ever have before. You're moving into the image of Jesus Christ. You're becoming more like him. Now, let me just remind you that the reason that, uh, the, that the writer of Hebrews had to address these is that he said they were slow to learn. That word there, learn, also means they were slow to listen. They were slow to listen. They didn't hear what was being said. Oh, they heard it but they didn't hear it. Do you understand? Uh, you, you, if you have uh, children, uh, you understand how this kind of works, right? Because you, you have already told your kids how to do what they need to do and what to do, but do they always do it? No. So what do you do? You repeat yourself, and you repeat yourself, and you say it over and over. Why? Because as a parent, you want to prevent them from making wrong choices and having hard things uh, happen in their lives. You want to keep them from touching the hot thing and whacking their head, uh, you know, on the, while they're on the skateboard and falling off and hitting their head, all, the, all those kind of things, those mishaps that can happen. And, and, you know, all they have to do, right, is listen to you. But do they? Probably not. Why? Human nature. Human nature, we all have a will. We all have a, uh, we all have a, a will that's struggling on the inside of us. It says, I know better. I know better. I know what I can do. I know what I'm supposed to do. I know what I'm not supposed to do. Well, the reality is that the more we listen to God, the more we listen to that kingdom playlist like we talked about last week, the more we spend time doing that, the more of God's nature that we begin to take on. And the more we hear what he has for us to do. And so the grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness and to worldly passions. Those are the things that shipwreck us. Those are the things that get us into trouble. If you were to trace back every bit of trouble that you ever got into, you could never blame it on God. You could never say, well, I was doing the will of God, everything I was supposed to be doing, and I ended up in sin. No, 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 no. That's not what happened. If you traced it all the way back, you would find some pride operating. You would, you, would, you would take yourself to the point, you'd say, oh, yeah, I did get the warning here, didn't I? Oh, yeah, I didn't heed that warning, blew right through it. And, and so what ends up happening is you didn't, you didn't embrace the grace of God to say no to ungodliness. You chose to do what you wanted to do. And guess what? You remained an infant, because now you still are just, you still just, well, I don't know, repentance from acts that lead to death. I don't know if I need to worry about that truth right now. Now, mature people by constant use, by constant use of those elementary truths have laid the foundation for their life and began to build their house. They began to grow. They learned about instructions about bap in baptisms, and they grew on that. They learned about faith in God, and they grew on that. They kept growing. They kept growing. And guess what? They just kept using those things over and over. Can I just tell you, every test you're ever going to face is an open book test. Every test you're going to face, it's an open Bible test. You can, you can use your Bible on it. That's right. You can use chapter and verse, every chapter and verse that you can find. You can use the Greek. You can use the Hebrew. You can use a treasury of Scripture knowledge. You can use a concordance. You can use whatever you want. It's all in there. Everything you need, it's right there. It's right there in God's book. But we've got to move on. We've got to grow up. And we've got to choose to do that. Why? Why is that so important, Pastor Ken? Because it's not all about you. Imagine the people that you could influence if you would move on to maturity. Imagine the people that you could, uh, you could uh, be a source of blessing for the kingdom of God if you would just decide, you know what, I'm going to put this thing behind me and I'm going to grow. And when I grow, I'm going to move on and, and God is going to use me to touch people and teach people and minister to people. You know, some of you would be in trepidation over that. You'd be saying, oh, I know, but James says that people that are teach are going to be judged more strictly. Yeah, it's true. But you know, here's the reality is by the time you move into a place of teaching, you're operating in more grace. Because you've learned how this thing works. You've discovered the ways of God. And he's teaching you some things on the inside. So you have just as much grace that you need to teach 
At, at every level, God releases more grace in your life. So I want you to get a hold of that. Um, so keep making those decisions because that's a vote for righteousness. Every decision you make for the flesh is a vote that God's grace is not sufficient for you. When you choose the flesh after you've had the grace of God revealed, you are saying, God, your grace doesn't make any difference in my life. I'm just going to live the way I used to before I ever knew God. Is that really how you feel? Is that really what you believe? Because I don't think so. I think, though, what is happening is that, that when we stop listening to his voice, when we stop listening to instruction, we begin to cast off the restraint of his word. But if we'll take in his word and we'll listen to his word and we'll let it change us on the inside, then the grace of God begins to build in our lives and begins to take over. Um, let me share uh, one other uh, passage, just a familiar passage, and I'm not going to go too deeply into it, but I want to uh, remind you of something that's a truth in this word. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 in verse 7. This is the Apostle Paul talking about how the grace of God happened in his life. He says, to keep me from being conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Have you ever bumped into anybody that said, hey, I really have a thorn in the flesh? Immediately when I hear that, I want to say, hey, what are those exceedingly great revelations that you have that qualified you for a thorn in the flesh? I don't think that's a normal Christian experience to have a thorn in the flesh. I think the Apostle Paul had it because of all the revelation he got. I believe that there was a, a, a demon that was assigned to Paul that because the enemy saw what was going on in Paul's life and how he was making such strides in the kingdom of God that he got his own hitman after Paul at that time. This is, you know, the surpassing. Paul got the revelation of the fivefold ministry. Paul got the revelation of communion. Paul got the revelation. All of these things. Paul, Paul didn't walk around with Jesus and the disciples uh, early on. That wasn't his experience. He was that apostle abnormal. Normally born, but he's God's using him in such a huge way that he comes to terms with the fact that the enemy has has sent uh, one of one of his hitmen after Paul, and Paul knew that God could just knock this guy off. And every time he comes back to the Lord about it, what does God say to him? My grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. You can, you can go through this, Paul, because my grace is sufficient for you. And I can't think of any more mature people uh, that I could compare anybody else with than the Apostle Paul. That man was, a, was the hallmark of maturity. Was he perfect? No. But he, he, he uh, in, encapsulated uh, the revelation of the, of the Lord and, and uh, ministry authority and power just flowed through Paul. Uh, all, all that he wrote, amazing man, and yet... He has this messenger of Satan. And what does God say to him in the midst of it? My grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. You and I, if we will choose to walk in maturity, it doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. But can I tell you that when we walk through uh, life, life's not all about being easy. You want the easy road? The easy road uh, is the way of the flesh at first. But later on, it's a really bad road. Uh, but the scripture tells us that if we'll choose to do the will of God, what we'll find is that God is a good God and that he will cause things to work for our good if we will choose to do his will. And his will for you is to grow up. It's time to grow up. You can't stay an infant forever. That's not God's plan for you. That's not his plan for all the people that he wants you to influence. So I just, just want to close in prayer today. And I want to challenge you to grow. Can we do that right now? Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord God, that by constant use, you have caused it uh, to take root on the inside of us and caused your grace to be more than enough for every circumstance that we could ever face. I pray, Lord, that we would be those people, Lord, that would choose above everything else to do your will. 
nothing more, nothing less, nothing else than the will of God, and that we would grow up in your will, and that we would change our world because we have chosen to grow. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You know what? Thanks for being with us today. Look forward to seeing you again real soon. God bless you, and have a great day in the Lord. generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children